Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, here we are in the ninth session of The Joy of Coding. We are uh, officially in the second half of the course. And uh, the second half of the course is where things start getting even more interesting. We're we'll talking about more and more advanced techniques for contemporary software development. We'll be talking about um, more complex environments for building software. And uh, like, like tonight, we're going to be talking about building web applications in Java, um, in particular a REST API and a Java client to that REST API. Um, and that's going to be something different. And so then uh, both tonight and on Wednesday, we are going to be exploring uh, project four, which is our, our REST API project. Um, but then looking ahead, uh, we then, in the last three weeks of the course, we're going to be doing Android uh, development and mob programming. So there's quite a bit um, of stuff to, to cover um, uh, between, uh, between now and the end of the course, which really isn't that much longer. Only got, uh, you know, four more weeks, including the final exam and stuff. So um, lots of cool stuff. Uh, you know, I, I acknowledge that uh, there's, uh, you know, quite a bit of work in progress right now. Uh, project 2 is due on Wednesday. And uh, then the, the other week after that is project three, but I do want to introduce project four uh, tonight so that you can know what's coming and so that you can make sure that your environment works to be able to build the, uh, the REST API project. So that's what we'll be doing uh, tonight and on Wednesday. But first, uh, as always, I wanted to open it up for uh, any questions that you might have about uh, project one, which uh, you all, all received feedback on uh, over the weekend, um, project two, which uh, I think many of you are uh, still uh, finishing up, and uh, or uh, project three or anything else that's going on in the course. So, uh, so what can I tell you? I think you had a question about yeah, the file format. Yep. Yep. Ah, uh, good question. Okay, so right in project two. The, the command line usage, well, let me just bring up project two so I can uh, show it here. So I think I assign that as project one. When did I assign project two? Here we go, Monday it is. So in, in project two, you have a dash text file uh, option. And this takes up two command line arguments. So the first one is dash text file, and then the argument following dash text file is the name of the file. And her question was, well, what if, you know, this name of the file is dash print? So if I say dash text file dash print, um, turns out I'm not going to test that case, but I think how I would implement it is I would say, okay, fine, the name of the file is dash print. So it's not like you're going to be printing out, so, it's not, so there's not an option there, it's not the dash print option, Instead, it is the name of the uh, the name of the file to use. So yeah, I mean the rules are that the command line argument following dash text file is always the name of the of the file. And we're uh, sorry, cool, good, good, yeah. And recall that if the name of the file is dash just by itself, then the oh sorry, no, no, that's pretty print. Sorry, it's pretty print when you say dash pretty dash. That's project three. Never mind. Um, let's see here. Question, uh, do we need to fix things based on project one feedback for project two? I would say yes. So I was just looking at the test cases for project two uh, the other day. I was reminded how many of them are duplicate because there's not all that much new uh, functionality. So for instance, I'm still going to validate that the program behaves reasonably when you know it has a, a bad time or a phone number that contains non-digits. Uh, or missing parameters, extra parameters, those kinds of things. So uh, what I highly recommend, and you've probably heard me say this like seven times on Slack already, is that um, when you get your project one feedback, actually regardless of whether or not you know you got everything perfect or there were some things that need to be fixed, that you uh, implement integration tests for the test cases that are in the, uh, the grading script. So right, you know, the grading script puts your project one through its paces, it executes like, 10 or so um, test cases against it. Uh, and I don't know, either of those are command line arguments or whatever. Implement those as integration tests. And what that will uh, get, give you is a suite of what are called regression tests. That will make sure 
that your project two behaves just like project one did. Okay, they're going to see some of those same uh, some of those same uh, test cases again. Uh, question: Does the error message need to specifically say the phone number contains characters, or can it say the format is off and should be integers only showing an example? I'm um, not. If you want full credit, so uh, you know, I think as uh, you know, several of you uh, received feedback on um, just saying that oh, there was an error on the command line and leaving it as an exercise to the user to figure out what exactly is wrong um, will get you some credit, but won't give you full credit. Um, you know, think about the usability of a program. And uh, the kind of feedback that you would like to see, you know, from the program. Um, just saying, you know, invalid command line, or and, and here's, you know, and here's the command line format. Um, yep, that I guess is better than nothing, uh, but it's uh, not as good as it could be, and doesn't necessarily show that uh, that that the logic of the program was specific enough to detect the particular. Uh, error situation that was there on the command line. So, to briefly answer your question, yes, if you want full credit for the test cases related to uh, an invalid command line, please specify, or you know, please be more specific about what exactly is wrong on the command line, such as a uh, malformed um, phone number uh, or uh, a date um, that doesn't match the format. That's project two due on Wednesday. The next week is project three. You can go back to the lecture from last week, last Monday, to learn about that. But I just wanted to give you a reminder as you know, as you're thinking about project two, looking ahead to project three. Here we're adding a new kind of phone bill dumper called Pretty Printer that will uh, oh, it looks like someone didn't receive any feedback or grade for project one. Please check your spam and um, and, and reach out to me on uh, on Slack, please, or send me an email or something. Um, I'll, I'll I'll go and check to see if uh, if I received the submission. I know there was one other uh, student who um, uh, one other student who uh, didn't get um, who, did, who didn't get a grade and said they submitted. So if maybe there was something gummed up or messed up, either. On my end or on your end, uh, but don't worry, we'll get you the uh, get you the feedback. Uh, project three is uh, again you're adding a pretty printer, which is a new kind of phone bill dumper, and you're going to have a new option called dash pretty file, which specifies um, where the uh, where the pretty output should be written, either a file or just standard output if the Name of the file is just dash. Nice. Anything else I can tell you about uh, what's going on in the course right now? Okay. Let's dive into uh, web applications. Now, I, I hope you had an opportunity to watch the, uh, the screencast, or at least look over the, the slides um, for the Foundations of the Web uh, lecture that talked about uh, Java web applications, uh, web containers, things like Jetty, and um, and, and how we're going to build web applications here. Because uh, tonight we're going to dive into the project four. So, um, in project four, we're going to take the phone bill application that we've been uh, building and, <coughs> and turn it into a, uh, a RESTful, uh, well, a, 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 give it, a, provide a, a REST API for it and then call that REST API from our command line. So, uh, you know, up until now, you've worked with objects 
you've worked with files in Project 3, you'll be working with formatting um, uh, data so that it's human readable. And now what we're doing is we're building a, a RESTful web service for our, our phone bill. And uh, this is to uh, give you uh, experience working with web applications in Java. And so then you'll be uh, doing more Java programming, but this time in the context of a, uh, of a web application. And so you'll be working with both the client and the server side. You'll be implementing the web service and uh, you'll be implementing a command line client that calls that web service. Now I'll go into uh, more detail later about how all this works uh, later in the class, but um, the whole idea is that uh, you'll be creating what's called a servlet for your phone bill. And servlet is a Java object that responds to HTTP requests and returns some HTTP response. And um, your uh, servlet will reside inside a web container that uh, will uh, root uh, HTTP requests to your, your server. And so when you hit the URL like uh, you know, HTTP and you specify the host and the port, your uh, slash phone bill slash calls and say customer equals name, um, if, you, if you request this URL using the get verb, it'll return all the calls in the phone bill for, formatted using the text dumper. Oops, I can't. Um, and so the whole idea is that when you send it get to the URL, you get the text format of the uh, phone bill with the cust for the customer of the uh, given name. If you send a post, you make a post request to that URL. That's what you use to create a new phone bill, sorry, a new phone call in the phone bill. So there it has requ request parameters like customer, caller number, callee number, begin and end. Um, and if, if the phone bill doesn't exist already, that's fine. Just create a new one there in the, uh, in the phone bill server. Note that in project four, you don't use the text dump, oh, sorry, you don't use the, well, you don't dump text to a file. Instead, what you'll do is you'll dump text to the rest endpoint. So you'll return, you'll use the text dumper to send um, text back to the client. You won't write it to a file. So this URL is all about uh, managing a, a phone bill, right? You use it to put phone bills, phone calls into a phone bill, and you use it to get all of the uh, calls in a phone bill as text. There's another uh, URL that your servlet should should support. It's the same servlet. It's still mapped to the calls endpoint, uh, but here you specify the customer. And you also specify a begin time and an end time. And what this does is it queries the, uh, the, the phone bill. And so this will return uh, all the phone bill's calls in the format used by the text dumper that begin between the begin time and end, but, oh, sorry, that, that begin between the begin and end time. So the begin and end time are just a query on the, well, the starting time of the uh, phone calls in that phone bill. And in the URL, the format of the date and time for the begin, ten, begin date time and the end, in, end date time is, uh, let's see here, um, you know, is the same as it is on the command line. So in starting in project three, it's, you know, it's three parameters. It's uh, um, a, a, a date, a 12 hour time, and an AMPM. So really, that's the, those are the, that's the server side capability. Of the of the servlet of the of the REST API, um, and note that because uh, you can create multiple uh, well, you can have multiple customer names when you add phone calls to a phone bill. You can the, the web application supports multiple phone bills, right? So if you think about like your project three and project well, project three and earlier, you can only ever have sort of one phone bill active in the system at a time. Here, because the phone bill server is a long-lived object that resides within the web container, um, it can manage multiple phone bills depending on what, uh, what customer names have been provided. Okay, so this is the, the external behavior for the, uh, the REST API. 
This REST API can be invoked like any REST API from any client, from a web browser, or from like a command line like curl, or from a Java program. And that's what your Project 4 class is. So there's also a Project 4 main class, which, uh, you know, is just like you've been working on for your first three projects. It parses the command line and it does something with it. And it does things related to the phone bill, but now it's going to do things with the, it's going to make calls to the REST API um, to perform operations on the phone bill. So it has the same five arguments that we, uh, we always have. So uh, when you invoke the, the, the command line, um, it'll have, you know, a customer uh, caller name, uh, you know, caller number, call number, begin and end time. But now it has some slightly different options because we're not, well, we're not writing text files anymore. Um, we're not doing pretty pretty. Well, we are, but it's, we'll see how it is in a second. So um, there's a dash host and a dash port. We specify the host and port that the, the server runs on, the, the, the REST API is hosted at. And then there's a dash search option. We'll talk about that in a moment. And there's a dash print and a dash repeat. Um, so again, there isn't a dash text file, there isn't a dash pretty. Note that uh, host and port don't have default values, so you uh, specify, you know, you always have to specify them together. Here are some examples. So using the command line, let's say I have my server running, I can add a phone call to the server by uh, using, well, by invoking the main method of my jar, by, you know, by, by Bring my executable jar with the provided host and port, and then the uh, the command line arguments that you're that you're used to, right? So you got the customer number, you've got uh, a phone, you've got two phone calls. Sorry, you've got two phone numbers, uh, and then you have a uh, begin time and an end time for the phone call that you want to create. Here's an example of searching for calls that are made in the month of March. And there are that begin in the um, month of March. So here again, you launch it with the host support and you say dash search. And when you, when you uh, search, all you need is the name of the customer and the begin time and the end time. You're not creating a new, uh, you're not creating a new phone call with this command line. You are searching for existing ones. And if all you provide is the name of the customer, then that will pretty print all the phone calls in the phone bill. Oh yeah, and by the way, uh, when you print stuff from the command line, it should be pretty printed. So it comes back from the REST API as text, uh, as a text file format from project two, but when, you, uh, but when the user sees it with the dash search command, it should pretty print it using the format from project two. So there are a bunch of error conditions that uh, you, need to, you need to account for. Um, and of course, making sure that your, uh, that your command line program has a graceful exit um, under reasonable error conditions. So you know, the usual stuff like, hey, if the command line has uh, you know, missing arguments or extra arguments, or if the um, format of the data time is incorrect. Also, it's an error if the uh, command line program cannot establish a connection to the, uh, to the server, again, there should be a graceful, a nice error message, uh, just like some big stack trace saying, you know, could not connect exception. Um, or if the, uh, if data that is passed to the REST URL is not correctly formatted, right? So it's very important that your REST APIs do input validation on the data that is provided. So that's what Project 4 ultimately needs to do, and that's a lot. So any sort of fundamental questions about the behavior of Project 4 before we start talking about how all this is implemented? Right. So now uh, let's dive into getting started. So with Project 4, you create a new Maven project, right? As, as you may recall, on, on a week two or something, we created Project 1. And then for Project 2, you took that same code and you evolved it uh, for Project 2 and you do the same thing for Project 3. Now here we are in Project 4 and we start over with a new project. 
because the REST API project is much more complex. It's got two pieces to it. It's got the servlet, which is deployed to a web container, and it's got the command line program. So it's more than just what you had in projects one, two, and three. So we create a new project. And the way you do that is you run the create REST project script. So I'm going to log into uh, the PSU machines, because you may recall you can only create the uh, project on the PSU machines. And so I'm going to go to my checkout here. And now so I'm going to pull down these changes. Let me just get all my keys and stuff set up. Let me type the passphrase correct. There we go. I'm going to do a git pull. Nice, everything's off to date. I'm going to run the create REST API project. So this creates a new project in my uh, repository for the class. So this is not the Kata's repository. This is the repository with my source code. So this is the thing that's akin to your private repository where all your projects live. So now in addition to the koans, to the student and the phone bill project, now I've got a, a new uh, directory called phone bill web. And that contains the, uh, the project for the, uh, the REST API. So now I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do, actually the first thing I'm going to do is going to commit the code. Uh, Palm.xml and phone bill web. And now actually I'm going to do status again. Good, lots of good stuff there. And we'll talk about what all these files mean, or what many of these files mean here shortly. Um, uh, and so then we're going to say uh, added um, source code for project form. And by the way, please feel free to uh, play along at home. Uh, the reason I'm going through this uh, is so that, uh, well, either tonight in real time or um, uh, you know, tomorrow, uh, you can make sure that you are able to build Project 4 in your own environment, whether it be on the PSU machines or on your local machines. So I've gone and I've added a new phone bill project. Um, I'm going to go into the phone bill web uh, directory and make sure that I can do a maven clean verify. So just like with your projects one, two, and three, we use Maven to build this project. Now, uh, Maven's going to do this, some of the same things they did with the first projects. It's going to compile your source code. It's going to uh, compile and run the unit tests for, uh, for the project. And you better believe that, these, uh, that, that the REST API has unit tests for it. Um, and then it's going to build the artifacts. Now, there are more artifacts with this project than there were in projects one, two, or three. Yes, you still have the command line project, so you have that uh, executable jar in the, uh, in the client. But then you've also got the artifacts that are necessary to run the web application. Uh, so if you watched the lecture, you learned about things like uh, web, uh, uh, web archives, the war files, um, that contain uh, all the pieces, parts of the, of the web application. In this case, it's the phone bill web application. And that war file gets deployed to a web container. We're going to be using Jetty here which then uh, provides all of the plumbing that can take in a uh, request for a, a, a URL and then serve up its content and respond to uh, the request for that URL. So Maven is going to build all of that and then it's going to run the integration tests. And as we'll see, the integration tests for this project are significantly different from the ones in the first three projects in that the integration tests here not only run the command line program, but they run. They also run the, the web server. They also run the web application because the command line program interacts with the web application. And so the goal that I wanted to provide you with is um, an environment that allows you to do the same kind of test-driven development for a web application that you did with a uh, simple command line, which is now seems, now seems simple, command line application that you did in projects one, two, and three. So I've got all the pieces parts. Looks like everything builds. This is good. I have, let's see here, did I do a git push? I can't remember. No, I didn't. Okay. So I committed all my code. I made sure that it ran. And now I've pushed it up to, uh, to GitHub. And now I'm done on the PSU machine. So I'm going to log out of that. I'm going to uh, go back. Uh, over here to my checkout, I'm going to do a git pull. 
right? This will pull down, and now here I am working on my local machine. Pulls down all the changes for the uh, for the web application, and now I'm going to run Maven Verify, Clean Verify over here. I'm going to phone the web directory, and I'm going to run the Maven Clean Verify over here, just to make sure that I can build it on my local machine also. Right, just validating, making sure that all the, the pieces parts are there. And again, it goes through, builds the source code, builds runs the unit tests, builds all of the, uh, the artifacts, and uh, then runs the, the unit tests, and, sorry, then runs the integration tests, make sure uh, it'll do things like start up the web container, and make sure that everything runs as expected. Oh, good, it does. Okay, so if you've gotten this far, what you've been able to demonstrate is that you can create the web application and that out of the box, it uh, behaves as expected. Um, well, let's talk about what the pieces parts are here. So, um, you know, Project 4 is an order of magnitude more complex than Project 3 because now you've got distributed computing. You've got two processes that are talking to each other. Just like in Projects 1, 2, and 3, you have a command line a program. This one's called Project 4. And you run it, right? You use the, right, you use, uh, you know, this command right here to, uh, to run it. So I can say java-jar target uh, phone bill client.jar and it runs a, uh, oh wow, okay, it printed out, print out a lot more stuff than I thought it would, um, but it you know, prints out some command line usage. So you've got that. But then over here, you've also got your web container, which is itself a Java program, it's called Jetty, and what it does is it responds to HTTP requests. And so you run the web container, and inside the web container is a web application, is the phone bill web application, which is built from the source code in this project. And inside that web application is your servlet. And so the servlet, as we'll see, is the Java object that responds to the, uh, responds to the, sorry, uh, responds to the, uh, to the HTTP requests. So the, the Project 4 command line program will make an HTTP request to the uh, web container, and then it will route the request off to your phone bill servlet and to a method like do get or do post. We're going to see this all in gory detail in a little bit, but that's sort of like at a high level what we're doing. So ultimately, what your project four needs to implement is all these capabilities that I talk about up here. With these things in the uh, phone bill servlet and a project four main method that uh, provide that, that interacts with the uh, with the servlet. And that will be a lot of code to write from scratch. And I want to provide you instead with enough scaffolding so that you can focus on the interesting parts of web application development and not and ignore or at least skip through some of the more some of the less interesting parts like how to configure a war file and deploy everything to Jetty. So so instead what you get out of the box is a, a, a project uh, a, a, an application that um, looks very much like this. There is uh, there's a project for uh, main method, and it has the ability to uh, communicate with a uh, with a phone bill web application. Except that it's not a phone bill yet. Instead, it's a simple dictionary. Um, instead of uh, storing a phone bill, it just stores well key value pairs like a dictionary, and, you know, a word and its definition. So what I'm going to do is over here on the right, I'm going to run the web application by uh, issuing command maven jetty run. And what this is telling uh, 
Jetty to do is to start up Jetty with the, with the web application that is defined in this project. Okay, and it looks like it's doing it. You can tell that because it's saying, hey, started this thing on localhost, or all, you know, all zeros in this case, port 8080. And now what I can do, actually, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop that by control seeing it. I'm going to run uh, this, this uh, main method again. And it's got, uh, it's got some command line options. Uh, the first one is uh, the name of the host. So it's going to be localhost. So localhost is like a well-known name for like this machine that I'm running on right here. Uh, it's going to connect on a port 8080. And um, let's see here. If I just give it this much, what the application is supposed to do is return um, all of the entries in the dictionary. Now, if I try to run it now, it's going to fail with an error message saying that connection was refused because at the moment nothing is running on localhost port 8080. What if I start up my Jetty again? And I run my command line program again. It connects, and it says that the dictionary on the server contains zero words, which is true because I haven't added anything yet. So now I'm going to add a word. I'm going to say doe a deer, a female deer. It said, it came back and said it defined doe as a deer, a female deer. And now if I run the command that ship prints all of the words in the dictionary, it now says dictionary on the server contains one words, okay, bad English, doe, a deer, a female deer. Okay. And of course, then we'll let's go through the whole song. Ray, a drop of golden sun. And now if I run it again, it's got both of them. So what this does, when I run this program, it ends up communicating with the server over here. And actually, it would probably be nice if I had some output over there so you could see that it has received uh, these requests. But we'll get to that in a moment. So you can use the command line option to interact with the server. But this is talking HTTP, and you can interact with HTTP in other ways, like say the web browser. So if I open up the, uh, if I open up HTTP localhost 8080, oops, localhost colon 8080, right? So this syntax is the name of the machine and say, say colon port, which you may or may not have encountered before. It returns uh, a HTML page saying that, hey, listen, there wasn't anything found at that URL, but however, there are known contexts, which is a Jetty word for um, web applications. And oh yeah, look, one of them is phone bill. Great, so I'm gonna navigate into here. The phone bill application comes with an index on HTML page, which is displayed here, which contains some simple HTML forms for interacting with the application. So if I uh, click submit here to list all dictionary entries, it goes to the URL slash phone bill slash calls, and I'll make it a little bigger here. As you can see, it prints out uh, doe a deer, female deer, ray a drop of golden sun, which uh, is actually the text representation of this dictionary. It's slightly different from the output here on the command line, which was the pretty representation of the, uh, of the dictionary. You don't have to interact with this through the form. You, you can uh, just you know, visit this URL directly. It prints out the same thing. So let's see here. Uh, me, a name I call myself. So I can also use this form to specify uh, values to post to the URL to create a new dictionary entry. So when I click submit here, it says, hey, define me as a name I call myself. Now, if I go back to list all of the entries, now it's got me a name I call myself. So this is how this simple web application works. You use things like the command line uh, to, uh, up, uh, no, to post um, new entries in the dictionary. 
And you can also use the command line to uh, query the, uh, the dictionary. Similarly, you can use this HTML form to do that. Now, an important thing to note about this, this index.html um, file is that um, I will not use this when testing your assignment. I only use it here for purposes of demonstration. As a matter of fact, this is based on an index.html that a student contributed because the student was like, hey, listen, I know something about HTML forms, and this was, you know, this really helped me interact with the, uh, with the, with the REST application. Um, on Wednesday, uh, we will um, spend some time morphing this simple dictionary application into something that looks a little bit more like your phone bill. And we'll make some changes here um, for the sake of demonstration. But you won't need to uh, do that for your assignment. Just one last time, just to be clear, you don't need to change the index.html as part of your assignment. As a matter of fact, you can't even submit the index.html as part of your assignment. So this is what the application does and what it looks like. It's got over here on the right, it's got the, uh, the, the web container that is serving up requests. And over here on the left, you have various clients to that. You've got a command line client, and then you can also use a web browser to, uh, to, get, at it, to get at it. Next, one more thing I want to show. You can list the definition of a word, like if I want to find the definition of dough, I just put that in here. Click submit, and it prints out that one definition of, of Doe. This is basically querying for a specific um, uh, entry in the dictionary. So I want to pause for questions. Out of the box, this is what your uh, what the phone bill project does. We'll talk a lot more about how it does it next. But any questions about what it does? and what these pieces parts are all about. Okay. Now something I want to point out. When you control C Jetty to stop Jetty, it's not running anymore. And uh, you know, if you try to run your command line program, it says connection refused. If you try to uh, load the uh, the web uh, page in, uh, oh, and of course, there's a question comes in. Question is, are we modifying the server to implement some data schema, or is it just a bucket and we basically fetch and get entries and and have to parse it manually? Um, uh, yes, I mean, there are parts of that, both parts of that are true. I mean, um, I'm not sure what you mean by data schema exactly. Do you mind coming off mute and maybe asking your question and we can have a dialogue about that? Yeah, is it, is it always just going to be like one, you know, a dictionary where you just have an entry and you put everything in, or are we going to be able to make it a little more like a relational database or something like that? Oh. It will not be like a relational database. Um, that would be kind of overkill. No, instead, uh, what you'll uh, what you'll have is you'll be using so out of the box, it's just strings, right? Key value uh, uh, you know, a key of a string and a, and a value of a string. Um, part of the assignment is to then morph that application into uh, something that uses your phone bill objects and your phone calls and your text dumper um, and things like that. So uh, in terms of data modeling and stuff, no, there really isn't anything terribly complex. You're going to be using the same classes that you used in project three to model the data, to manipulate the data, to, uh, you know, to create phone calls, to format uh, phone, phone bills into various text formats, things like that. Any follow-ups on that question? Okay, yeah, that, that answered it. So, yeah, I just wasn't sure if the servlet was like, if if our data models could be applied to it or not. So that, um, I think that answered it. Well, I was going to say, I mean, the data model is there in that you have a, a class, you have an object representing the data, but we're not going to be translating it to um, anything external, which actually was just about to show you. So uh, note that 
Um, okay, so I, I stopped the um, I stopped the jetty. I was no longer able to connect with the command with the with the command line tool. When I go and reload the page, it says it can't be loaded because localhost refused to connect. So the servlet is down. Now when I restart the servlet, now I can reload the page. The page loads again, few. And then when I go look at all the entries, all the entries are gone. So for project four, you do not need to persist the phone bills outside of the uh, web application. You've already demonstrated that you know how to write a file to disk. You don't need to do it again. And it'd just be one more requirement for project four and doesn't really you know, teach you anything new. But as a result, all of the data is uh, ephemeral and only exists as long as the servlet is running. Once the jetty is, uh, uh, once the jetty is shut down, then you lose all your data. And that's okay. Right? That's what, you know, for, for this assignment, that is perfectly fine. So now I can go back in and, uh, well, we'll go back and add some more, uh, add some more data here shortly. But first what I want to do, I want to take a detour through the code and start looking at uh, the, the code for, uh, for this. So, oops, I didn't want to do it full screen. Just want to do it in the big screen. Okay. Now let's see here. I uh, I need to synchronize my. I need to reload everything from disk so that I will find my phone bill web project in my uh, in my checkout. And it looks like uh, hello. Oh wait, that's not that's not my code. Those be the katas. We don't need those tonight. Yeah, here we go. Here's my code. Okay, and I've got phone bill web. So again, there's a new directory in my code. It's called phone bill web. And this is a Maven project, so it's structured the same as other projects that you've seen. It's got a source directory, and it's got integration tests. It's got the main. It's got a site. It's got unit tests. Let's take a look at main. Uh, main has this web app directory, which you won't be needing, although it does have the index.html. So maybe we can look at that real quick. Um, boy, I don't know if you're at all familiar with HTML or have ever really looked uh, to see what it's all about. And if you're like, oh my gosh, this isn't, you know, 1997, I avert my eyes, I do everything in JavaScript these days, that's fine. Again, this is, if, if it helps you to use the index.html, if this is how you think about web applications, go ahead and use it. If you're like, this is, you know, this is foreign, it's another thing to learn, then don't. Um, so uh, it's got you know three forms, and here's where it has like the text for list all uh, dictionary entries, and here's where you've got your submit button for all of this. It isn't like definition anymore. Okay. Um, and uh, you know here again, you've got three forms here, and two of the forms will perform a get an HTTP get on the calls URL, and this third one will per perform a post an HTTP post on the calls URL, and this is the one that has. Uh, three inputs. It has a text input for the word. So there is a parameter called word. It's text put input for uh, definition. And so the name of the parameter is definition. And then it's got a submit button. So that's the index.html uh, file. Also here in the uh, the main source code is the uh, the Java code for here. So again, uh, well. This is, with Java course, right? And so then um, when we implement this stuff, we implement it with Java. Um, uh, there are two interesting classes. There is the uh, project four main class, but let's take a look at the servlet first. Now, the, the Jetty web container is a third party piece of software. It's a big open source project. And what it does is it provides an implementation of the standard interfaces for writing web applications in Java. It's something called the Servlet API. And you learn all about it in the, in the lecture. But the whole idea here is, is that there is uh, an API, and if you program to this API, 
you can plug into the, uh, the web container. So our servlet, phone bill servlet, extends HTTP servlet. HTTP servlet is the, um, is the uh, abstract class that is provided by the servlet API, and this is third-party code that someone else has written. Question came in. Um, oh, is anyone else having trouble accessing the project for PDF? Oh, yeah, is anybody else unable to get to it? No, okay, we're not hearing reports of that here. Um, are you getting a 404 or something? Oh, some people want to, uh, I wonder if something is something bad about the, uh, the PDF, I wonder. Because like, oops, oh, it timed out, that's weird. So can I reopen it? Oh, look at that. Huh, I wonder if there's something wrong with the, uh... huh. Can I download this still? Actually, I don't need to, I've got the original. Never mind. Uh, yeah, let me quick post it in Slack. That's weird. Yeah, I wonder if there's something wonky going on with the CS department's machines or something. Maybe they're using CrowdStrike. I don't know. Um, sick burn? Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Let me let me just upload it real quick. I think I've still got it here someplace. Let me go. Let me go find it. Let me go find it. I will uh, upload it to Slack. And I was going to say, let's see here. Attach. I have a recent file with my computer. Uh, I gotta find it. Hello. Okay, there we go. Um, let's see here. In my home directory, if I go to PSU get all the secret places, and I go to slides, no, I go to projects. And we are doing the phone bill project, and we are doing the REST PDF. I believe that is it. Exactly. Nice. Okay. So, uh, yeah, hopefully you can uh, access it in the slide. Okay. Um, so, uh, the key part of, of this program is really the newest thing for Project 4 is the phone bill servlet. This extends HTTP servlet, which gets you methods like do get. Now, do get is what is invoked when the slash phone bill slash calls URL is invoked, is requested with an HTTP GET verb. So the, the way, you know, the way this works is that you have this phone bill servlet object that has methods that are called by Jetty when various URLs are, uh, you know, no, I'm doing dumb by right here. Yeah, let's see here, it doesn't have, uh, okay. so I'm gonna open it up now myself so I can show you that picture. Uh, Projects from the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that reader. Oh boy. Okay, didn't like that very much. Fine, I'll open it from my browser. Uh, open. Actually, 
When was the last time I opened a file here? Um, it was probably a very long time ago. Uh, luckily, this thing keeps it open for me. There we go, rest on PDF. Cool. Um, anyway, as I was saying, if we look at what's happening over here on the right inside our web container, uh, there is this foam bill web application that's been deployed inside the web container that contains a foam bill servlet. So this is the foam bill servlet. And when some client makes a request as an HTTP get of slash phone calls slash calls, it routes the phone bill uh, to the foam bill web application and then routes the calls part of the URL to the phone bill server and ultimately to the do get method. And so when we invoke do get, well, sorry, when we invoke, well, when we have a get request for the servlet, what does it do? Well, it just calls this method. And so this is nice. So this is a Java code that then responds to a web request. And it, uh, the do get method uh, is overridden. It's something that's inherited from HTTP servlet. And it has two parameters. It has what's called an HTTP servlet request and HTTP servlet response. And these two objects represent the request coming in from the client and then the response going back to the client. And so you can do things like, okay, you know, when I call my method, I'm going to say the type of data that I'm sending back to my response is text slash plain. This is a MIME type, which I don't know if you've encountered yet, but it's basically it says here's the encoding. Here's what you can expect. Just plain text. And then what it'll do is it'll say, hey, get me the, uh, give me a parameter from the request. So then, uh, like for instance, when we, oops, oh, did I lose my local host here? I guess I did. Uh, let me go back to my phone bill. When I uh, look for the word dough, You'll see the URL uh, ha ends with question mark word equals dough. And so uh, everything after the question mark is what's called the query part of the, of the URL. And that is interpreted by Jetty and then delivered to this do get method as uh, parameters inside the request. So I've got this, um, nice, so I've got this, um, uh, so I've got this get uh, parameter method that will take it takes the name of a parameter whose value to get and an HTTP server request and it's nice and it handles the fact that it might be null or it might be empty or whatever um, to then call get parameter and from request which is the servlet API and then return the appropriate value and that's called here from the uh, the do get method. So there's a lot to this code. And uh, like I said, in project four, we start working with a, uh, a distributed software system. And so you've got two sides of the equation, right? You've got the, the server side over here, you've got your phone bill server, and then you've got the client side, which might be you know, your, well, your project four client, or it might be a web browser or something else. The, the server doesn't really care how it's invoked. All it knows is that its, its job is to respond to these requests appropriately. So there's a lot of code here, and the code is kind of uh, difficult to just walk through, or just to look at and reason about. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, let's take a break. Let's take a 15 minute break. We'll come back at 10 minutes past seven, and we're gonna run this code under the debugger so we can understand the relationship better between the client and the server. So we'll see everybody in 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, actually we've got a couple extra minutes of break because I flaked it. So um, in the first part of class, we uh, started talking about project four, which is the REST API project. Um, and there was a question that came in during break Will there be a program five? Yes, there's a project five. That's your Android project. Um, and we'll see if the website's working yet. But here it'll be, we'll, we'll start talking about Android next week. 
and we'll do, do kind of like what we did today. We will, you know, get uh, our build environment set up, and there's actually way more stuff to install in Red Studio. There's a whole bunch of stuff to do, but we'll start doing that next week, and then we'll really dive into uh, in, into it on uh, on the fifth, and then, uh, well, actually, I mean, you'll, you'll be able to get started on it during here, but then, yeah, sort of in the last you know, week and a half, well, the last two weeks of class is when you'll be uh, focusing primarily on, on Android. Actually, yeah, I mean, there should be, I uh, said so there was an entry for it in Canvas, I'm a little surprised, I thought I had, uh, I, had I thought I had stuff like that, but um, yeah, if you IM me, I'll follow up on it. Um, yeah, Project 5, here we go. Oh, those are things might be loading again, so anyway, we'll talk about that later. Because tonight we are talking about, uh, okay, that is the, the POA, but not the uh, actual project itself. Okay, well, a few. I'll, uh, I'll fix that. So anyway, there are two parts to project uh, four, the, the REST API. There is the, uh, the web container that has the phone build web application, and then there is a command line uh, tool. And we, we saw that you can interact with the, uh, so oh, we saw that you could interact with the uh, phone bill web application through a browser because it's just HTTP. And so then you can get all the dictionary entries. I guess there are none of them, so let's put one in. I'll do that from the command line, just so we've got some data. Uh, doe a deer, female deer. And then if we get all the entries in the dictionary here, uh, yep, there it is. And, and so the, the whole idea here is that the the web container is a long running program. It just sits there and waits for uh, HTTP requests to come in and then it'll fulfill them appropriately. And those HTTP requests can come in from anywhere, can come in from a command line tool, can come in from a web browser. The uh, server doesn't really care. Its job is just to fulfill those requests. As I, and we started to look at the code a little bit and we saw this phone bill servlet class which extends HTTP servlet. And it's got methods like do get, and the do get is the code that responds to the get request. And so when someone makes an HTTP get request, do get is invoked. To explore this a little bit better, I'd like to run this under the debugger. Um, and there is, let's see here, I think if we go and look at, yeah, the readme file, I'm pretty sure I've got a whole bunch of information about, oh yeah, how can I use a debugger. So um, here is uh, some stuff about how to debug things in Java and with IntelliJ. And so let's, um, yeah, let's, let's do that uh, tonight. So what I want to do is I want to run my uh, jetty under a debugger so that I can attach uh, IntelliJ to the, the jetty process, set breakpoints, and uh, then be able to step through the code. Now, am, am I correct that you're all familiar with the concept of a debugger? I think right, everybody uses like GDB or something like that in the lower division courses. Okay, good. So hopefully, you know, you understand sort of the concept of a debugger. I don't know whether or not you've seen a visual debugger or not, like IntelliJ. Um, and uh, what my former students told me is that once they see it in IntelliJ, they like get really angry at the people who taught the lower division courses because like, why did you do this? It was so much easier to use than GDB. So anyway. Let's do that. So in Java, uh, Java has built-in debugging facilities, and uh, but you need to configure it. So uh, Jenny is just a Java program, and so then when you've got a Java program and you want to debug it, you can, uh, in IntelliJ, uh, create what's called a debugging configuration. So you go up under your list of run, running configurations, and uh, here I've got like a bunch of JUnit tests that I've run recently. I'm going to add a new configuration. I'm going to find the remote uh, JVM, remote JVM debug configuration. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to say uh, localhost is the host I'm connecting to. And I'll say port 5005, which is kind of the default port. And I want to say yes, I want to attach to a remote JVM. And um, this right here is important. It's the command line arguments that you give to the Java VM. Say, I want to run you. Uh, as uh, you know, in debuggable mode, which means that if uh, it'll, the JVM will sit there and open a port and wait for something like IntelliJ to attach to it over that port 
and then uh, they'll then, then the JVM will uh, well uh, yeah the JVM will tell uh, IntelliJ when a breakpoint has been hit. So I need to get this text right here. I need to copy it to the clipboard. This whole dash agent lib thing, and then over here in uh, my uh, command line where I run Jetty, I'm going to set an environment variable called Maven Ops, which these are. Um, this is an environment variable that Maven pays attention to, and it will add these uh, options to the Java command line. Um, yeah, the, the, the Java command line that is used to run Jetty. So when I say Maven Ops equals that big mess, I set that, and now when I run Jetty, it'll say that it's listening for uh, the debugger on port uh, five zero zero five. Great. And then it goes and it launches Jetty. Okay, Jetty is running. Back in IntelliJ, I can save my debug configuration. And now I can run my debug configuration by clicking debug up here. And it tells me that it connected to the JVM on localhost 5005. So this is port 5005, which is used for debugging. Now I'm gonna go back to my source code. Let's see here. I'm going to make my source code big so I can see what's going on. And I'm going to click over here in the margin to set a breakpoint for a certain line. So in IntelliJ, I can click in the margin and it, uh, well, it's a breakpoint, meaning that when that when I'm attached to a debugger and that line of code is executed, uh, the debugger will pause right before executing it. So my Jetty is running and it's waiting for someone to talk to it. So I'm going to go back to my uh, web page here and I'm going to go back to my form and now I'm going to uh, get the definition of a word. I'm going to get the definition of dough. I'm going to click submit and then IntelliJ pops up saying wait a second you just hit a debug breakpoint. So when I click submit on that it makes an HTTP GET request which is ultimately delivered to my do GET method. So now here I am in the debugger. So this is what you see in the IntelliJ de debugger. Uh, here you have the, the, the code editor, and um, it, uh, when it hits a breakpoint, uh, it's highlighted in blue. And uh, you can then interrogate information about what's going on in the JVM uh, at this particular point. Now, uh, down here below, you have the debugger pane, which tells you things like what code is being invoked by this particular thread. Um, and so you can see that here is my do get method here at my servlet, but everything else up in the call stack, everything that calls this code is all super internal stuff to like you know, internal Jetty stuff and servlet API stuff and okay, I don't really care about that. What I care about is what's being um, invoked in my code right here. Then also in the debugging pane, you get information about the, uh, the, 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 the live objects, uh, the, the data that is uh, being used by this method. So do get is, uh, is passed in a request and a response, and you can learn about those objects right here. So here's my request. You can click on it to get all sorts of gory details. But maybe more interesting is that you can evaluate uh, the, an expression here. So I can say, hey, request, and I want to invoke a method on it. Like I want to invoke the get request URL. And so now I can see here in my debugger, um, I, can, I can sort of set a, I can watch for it, I guess. And saying, hey, listen, the, uh, the result of calling uh, request.get request URL is this string, HTTP colon localhost, you know, 8080 phone bill phone calls, which was exactly the URL that, well, that I'm about to request here. I'm going to get rid of this. Um, yeah, remove watch. I'm going to leave that there. And you know what? I think instead of evaluating expressions down here, I like to do it better up here. Um, but we'll get back to that later. So currently I'm executing this blue line and I can use these buttons right here to navigate through the code. So uh, there's step over and step into. If you're making a method call, step into will go into the text of that method, will go into that method call, debug into that method call. We'll see that in a moment, but in the moment I'm just gonna step over this one. So I'm gonna set the content type to uh, uh, text plane. Now I'm gonna step into this get parameter method. And the debugger takes me to, well, the first line of that get parameter method. And so now I'm going to uh, say, hey, ask the request for the, 
parameter of type word, or sorry, with parameter named word. And in this case, when I uh, step over that, the value returned by that is going to be dough. Because in here, I put the word dough. And if we go and look at my index.html, what this, uh, let's see here, yeah, let's see the word. What this does is it calls an HTTP get on calls. So the, uh, the is it should be, it was the do get method that was called. And uh, the, actually the name of the input box is word. And so uh, what this HTML form does is it will create the URL that uh, has um, word equals dough. Um, and if we go back to our code, which is right here, so value is dough, and it's nice that, you know, here in, in kind of gray, um, IntelliJ is giving me all sorts of information about, uh, yep, about the, the objects that are live right here. And let's see here, value is, uh, is not null and is not equal empty. So if I keep navigating, it'll say, great, return value, return dough, okay? So now my word is dough. And so here, now my word is not null. And so now I'm gonna write the definition of dough. So I'm gonna step into this. And this is my code right here in my server still. And so uh, it, it's saying, hey, I'm gonna write the definition of the given word to the HTTP response. So I have a, a dictionary object, which is just a map of strings to strings, which contains all my dictionary entries. And actually I can, I can look at that. So I'm going to uh, highlight this right here. I'm going to right click. I'm going to say evaluate expression. And so now this gives me the ability to like, you know, uh, manipulate this thing. So I'm going to see what, what is the size. Um, size is, oh, the size is zero. Oh, I guess I haven't, did I not add it? Oh yeah, I didn't add it yet. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Not exactly what I expected. Um, but uh, my definition here is going to be null then. So what do I do when uh, I try to look up a word that doesn't exist? Well, this is a, an exceptional condition. It's kind of like an error condition. And in HTTP, the protocol itself um, has HTTP status codes, right? We all know what a 404 is. We've all seen by a, you know, an internal 500 or whatever. Um, so the whole idea is that each each, each HTTP request, when its response comes back, one of the pieces of information is, hey, uh, what is its status code? Was it happy? Was it like a 200, meaning everything was okay? Or was it a problem, like a 404, like not found? In this case, because the definition is null, we are going to set the status of response to this constant, sc not found, which has a value of 404. So this is how you specify, oh yeah, this URL can't be found. You say that it's, uh, that the response for a request for it has error code 404. And that's it. So I've written the definition. And now I'm done with that method. So, oh, sorry, I was using the keyboard shortcut there. So now I'm just gonna continue, uh, continue running. And so now the do get method has returned. The servo is still running. But now here in the web page, I get a 404. I'm going to put uh, doe deer or female deer back into the uh, back into the dictionary, and actually, I'm going to print out all the. Actually, I'm not going to do that. So now I'm going to do that same thing again, but now that there's data in there, so I can show you the other code path. So now, when I list the dictionary uh, definition for doe, I'm back here at the beginning of my do get method. I'm going to step through things and get my word. My the word again is going to be doe, right? And now I'm going to uh, I'm going to step into write definition. Now, when I evaluate this dot dictionary, and I look at its size, oops, it's got one entry, and I don't know, what can I find out about this thing? Um, it's map, so I can say dictionary dot, well, <laughs> oh, not very many, uh, methods here as the map. Well, so can I get a key set? Yeah. And it's got the key, the key set has one thing, 
And can I get the entries or the entry set? Yeah, there it is. It shows that it's got doe a deer, female deer in it. But this is what you can do under the debugger, right? I'm sitting here, I pause in the middle of my program, and I can interrogate uh, the state of my program to figure out what's going on. So, of course, debugging is good at finding bugs, but I've also found that debugging is a good way to understand what a code base does, especially when it's got kind of complex logic. And I don't feel like writing a unit test for that, but we'll see how to write unit tests for this stuff pretty shortly. Okay, so now I'm going to get a definition, and it's got a definition. The definition is a deer, female deer. So definition is not null. And instead, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some content to the HTTP response. Now, uh, basically what I want to do is I want to format the word and the definition in, uh, in, in a way that is that can be consumed. And actually, I'm going to call this the text dumper format for my dictionary. Because you're going to using your text dumper when it comes to formatting the phone calls that are, um, that are returned, or the, actually the phone bill, that is returned um, by your do get method. So I'm going to create here a, a map that uh, just contains the one uh, word definition. And, uh, oh yeah, important thing to note here. So my text dumper dumps to a print writer. Now, the particular print writer that it dumps to is the one that's created by the HTTP response. So recall that this HTTP servant response is the object that represents, well, whatever is sent back to the client. And one of the methods on the HTTP servant response is, you know, we've seen set status, or we've seen set content type, and now we get, when we, we see get writer. So the authors of the servlet API wanted to um, abstract out the text content of the servlet response. And they decided to model that using a standard Java IO print writer. And I'm so glad they did, because this is an object that I'm already familiar with, right? You know, print writer we started using in project two. Um, we learned all about it in the Java IO lecture. So this is uh, just a standard Java class that we can then easily use with other APIs like our text numbers. So if your text number already took a writer, well, it can take, take print writer. It's not going to know the difference. And so then I can pass that print writer to my text number. And now all of a sudden I have a text number that can dump, dump the text representation of my dictionary out to a HTTP servo response. And that's exactly what happens when I, uh, oops, step up, always doing that. Um, step over, step into the dump method here. And then, well, that's weird. Oh, it's looking at the constructor. Okay, fine. Oh, that's funny. Huh. For whatever reason, the, oh, this is the wrong text dumper, I bet. Yeah, this is the one from phone bill. I should instead be in the text dumper for, um, I ended up with two text dumper classes, and I guess confused IntelliJ because they're both in the same package. Fair enough. Um, can I open up the other text dumper? Yeah, we want one from Phone Bill Web. Basically, what this does is it goes through and you know, wraps another print writer around whatever writer's in, and then it prints out every um, dictionary entry with a, a colon in between the key and the value, and then flushes it and returns. So I will, uh, I'll just jump out of this. Great. And so it's dumped all of that stuff to the print writer. And then it sets the HTTP status saying, yep, you are okay. So this corresponds to a, a HTTP status code 200. Saying, yep, I was able to fulfill your, your request, no problem, here's your response. Okay, so let's just continue to uh, go out of here. And uh, we're done with that method. We've written the definition. And now we're done with do get again. So let's continue on. And now when we go back to our browser, we see that it has written that text. This is exactly what the text number uh, wrote. Uh, the, the word, colon, the definition. So that's how the do get method works. Right? It's the, the logic actually is pretty simple when you think about it, right? It's, it's not doing that much. It's uh, getting a little bit of information from the HTTP request. And it has some very simple logic saying whether or not if the word was specified, then it writes, you know, the definition of the word. It will go look up the word in the dictionary and, and formats it out. 
See, there's not a lot of stuff, lot of stuff here. It's just that it's a little bit more advanced now that we're in the context of a servlet. Now, similarly, if word is, is null, then we'll write all the dictionary entries. And um, let's just quickly do that so I can walk through the code with you. So again, you can see how, uh, how, uh, how debugging works. So here again, I'm uh, back at do get. And uh, now when I get the word, the word is null. So I'll write all dictionary entries. And uh, what does this do? Well, it just gets the entire dictionary and dumps that. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. And so all of the, uh, all the dictionary entries get uh, which dumped, which I suppose in this case was only one of them. And once again, I return an error code, uh, HTTP status code 200, saying everything's fine. And I'm done. So, and again, I get all of them. So that's how do get works. It simply responds to the, 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 the get requests that come in um, from either uh, the, uh, the web client, or I suppose I can do the same thing here, where I can ask the uh, command line program, give me the definition of dough, and it's going to be you know, the exact same thing that we did the, the first, in that first debugging session. Because again, it, the, the servlet doesn't know, it doesn't really care, that this is being invoked from the command line program. It's just being asked to fulfill uh, a URL request, which is right here, the, uh, the HTTP localhost 80, 80 slash phone bill slash calls, question mark, word equals dough. The same request comes in both times. And so the same response comes back, which is kind of an important thing in HTTP because it's meant to be a stateless protocol, or REST is meant to be a stateless protocol. Here again, I'm asking for dough, and I'm going to write that dough response, and now I'm done. And so sure enough, what is returned and then printed out by the uh, command line client is dough a deer if you milk it. That was a lot. We saw debugging, we saw HTTP. Any questions? about what you've seen just now. Okay. Um the other method in the servlet is do post. Now, um, do post implements so, so different verbs as you learned or will learn about in the um, in the web lecture. Um, different uh, different verbs have different meanings in REST, or different HTTP verbs have specific interpretations in REST. And when you do a post. It is meant to create data. So uh, when the post uh, method is invoked, when you do a, an HTTP post request, what this does is it will uh, is it will create a new entry in the in the dictionary. So let's set a debugger breakpoint here, and let's go back to our simple web page. And we'll create a dictionary array, uh, drop a golden sign. Oh, yay, I remember from the last time I did this. And I'll click Submit. Now we stop in the do post method. Now here, um, the, if you look at the URL, the URL that comes across doesn't have a question mark uh, in it. Instead, for post, HTTP posts, the data that's passed along is in the body of the request, and that doesn't show up in that two-string printout right here. So we'll see how, that, how this works momentarily. So uh, here we have, once again, we have a do post method, and it comes with an HTTP request and an HTTP servlet response. And uh, let's walk through this code. So we're going to first, uh, once again, say, listen, what we're going to return back to you is just plain text. And now we're going to get the, uh, the word parameter again. And uh, this time we're, we're going to call the request a parameter, and it will uh, once again have the value of ray, or sorry, it'll have the value of ray this time. 
Great. So the, the post, I'm, I'm going to create an entry for the word ray. And notice that if it was missing, uh, well, I will look for, let's see here, how can I do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll do that shortly. I'll, we'll do the happy path first, first, and then we'll look at some of the error handling. So then we will, um, let's see here, we'll say uh, the word is not missing. And then we'll get the definition. The definition is the, uh, the phrase drop of golden sun. So, okay, it's all happy there. Now I'm going to store the word in my dictionary. So remember, this dot dictionary is a map that's associated with my servlet that stores all of the data. So I'm going to put that into the dictionary. And now I'm going to get that print writer for the response and merely uh, send back an informational uh, message saying that, yes, I defined the, uh, the word ray as a drop of golden sun. I will uh, flush all of the uh, output to the, uh, to the underlying HTTP servlet response, and I'll say, yep, my, uh, this went okay, I get uh, a value of 200. And now we're done with the post, we'll just keep on continuing. And uh, sure enough, it printed Ray, uh, defined Ray as drop of golden sun. Now let's take a look at some of the error conditions and how they're handled. So let's see here. Let's say I am missing a, uh, I'm missing an entry for uh, fa, a long, long way to run. Okay. I'm back in my do post method because here I am creating data and I'm going to set my uh, content type. I'm going to get my uh, parameter uh, for the word, which is fa, and uh, I'm going to get my definition. A uh, definition is null because I didn't provide one. So here I'm going to call this missing required parameter method here in my server and I send in uh, the response and then with the name of the parameter that is, uh, is missing. Uh, step into that, and um, I'm going to format the, the the error message. And so this is going to be uh, the required parameter definition is missing, and I'm going to call send error on the HTTP servlet response, saying uh, with an HTTP uh, status code of 412, which is precondition failed, and with uh, with that message. And so now I'm going to basically tell the response, hey, listen, that was a bad request. I'm sorry, I can't handle it. And, uh, and here's why. I'm going to return from my post method because there's nothing else to do, right? Basically, I'm sending back the error. So I'm going to return from that. And I'm going to continue on in my debugger. Or I'm going to actually detach, from, not detach, I'm going to resume the program. And sure enough, I, it comes back with uh, this message, the required parameter definition is missing. And... I guess the page doesn't really convey it, but there was a four error code 412 that was sent back there also. So this is what you need to do in your servlet. In the, uh, you need to check to make sure that the incoming parameters are correct, that they're formatted correctly, that they um, are something that you can work with. And if they aren't, then you need to issue, uh, you, know, you, you need to send back an error code, uh, error status code with the HTTP servlet response. So that was uh, the do post method. Any questions about that? Anything that uh, you're still left wondering? Yeah. Yes, the print writer. Thanks for asking for uh, clarification. Print writer is a Java IO print writer, and so then yeah, it's the same print writer that's used. Uh, that we learned about in the Java I.O. lecture, you're probably, you might be using, well, you'll be using readers and writers in your uh, project too, uh, when you uh, write your, when you author your text dump or your text book. Yep. Yes, writers write text. Yep, and so yeah, what you're writing to, because we've set the content type as text plain, they, uh, the, the, the server API provides a nice way of just writing um, text to the to the response. Now you can also write binary to the response. Let's say you've got sorry, yeah, yeah, as a, as a, an output string. 
Um, I'm pretty sure, yeah, there's also a get output stream. Yeah, there you go, right, yeah. So there's get, get, there's get output stream, which turns a server output stream, which I'm sure is a subclass of Java IO output stream. Right, because I mean, you can, you can have servers that return binary content, like, you know, images or PDF files or whatever. So, one last thing I want to show you. So, this servlet object is, uh, is pretty cool, and it has the logic for a lot of your program. And because there's a lot of logic, uh, you want to be able to test it. But how do you test an object that is used to, expects to be running inside of a servlet container, inside of a web container? Uh, now, as we'll learn about next time, there are these integration tests that'll start up Jetty and run against that, but that's slow. You want, I mean, we, we, you want to write a unit test. You want to have something that very easily uh, lets me test the, the, do, the, the do get method and the, uh, and, the um, uh, and the do post method. Now, if you just try to, uh, this is Java code, so you can, you know, instantiate a phone bill servlet. It's got a zero argument constructor, and actually it's not going to blow up if you do that. But how do you test your doGet method? Your doGet method takes uh, an object of type HTTP servlet request. Well, how do you create one of those? Right? I mean, you go look at this thing. It's like, a, it's an interface that's here in the servlet API. And it's got a whole bunch of methods that you have to implement, and some of them are already implemented. This seems pretty complex, right? I have to create one of those on my own? That's gonna be a pain. Well, luckily, there, um, there, there's, a, there's a way to handle this. And it's called mock objects. So the other lecture that uh, what was for tonight's class was, sorry, let's go find it. Um, oh, yeah, it was, there we go. Testing with mock objects. So this is another one of those pretty advanced things that we cover in this course. So the whole idea is that instead of creating real uh, HTTP servlet requests, real HTTP servlet responses, you create what are called mock objects, which are these objects that you can essentially, that, that will provide the same interface as the servlet request and the servlet response. But you can program them, for lack of a better word, to behave the way that you want. And so what ends up happening is that your unit test invokes the real code, the real do get method, but it sends in these mock objects here that as long as, you're, as long as they behave the way that your program expects, then you'll get the result that you want. So let's take a look at that now. Oops. In the, uh, the test directory, there is a phone bill servlet test. And uh, this phone bill servlet tests will uh, will exercise the do get method with a very special request and a very special response. So let's take a look at this thing. Okay, initially servlet contains no dictionary entries. So what does this test do? Well, it creates a new servlet and then it sends a uh, uh, one of these mock requests to the do get method and then uh, asserts that um, uh, nothing is written to the response. So let's run it just to demonstrate that it works. And it does what it's supposed to. And then we'll look at the code to see how it does that. Oh, looks like it needs to build for a moment. Uh, oh, I am still, um, still in the debugger. I'm gonna attach from the debugger. I say stop debugging session. Yeah, that's good. I don't need to be attached to the uh, servlet, or the JDBM. A moment, and that passed. So this is a plain old unit test. It does nothing, uh, does nothing special. But it uses this library called Mockito, which I talk about in that lecture about uh, mocking objects, to provide these synthetic, I guess for lack of a better word, um, instances of HTTP servlet requests and HTTP servlet response that uh, will work the way that you expect. So, here I have an HTTP servlet request object, which is ultimately passed into my do get method, that is created not by invoking a constructor, by using, but by using a special method called mock. 
and you say, hey, give me a mock instance of this interface. And you say, okay, name the interface dot class, right? You saw this dot class syntax in some of the koans and stuff. This is basically saying, hey, here is a, uh, an object that represents the HTTP server request class itself. Make me a mock instance of that class. So I make a mock request and a mock response. I'm also going to create a mock print writer because what I, what, I'm going to create a mock print writer. So here are all my mock objects. And then what you do with mock objects is you configure them. I don't know, program that was the right word. You, you tell them how to behave. Sorry, you instruct them how to behave. So I want to say the following. I want, to, I, I want, when, I, I want the print writer associated with my HTTP servant response to be this print writer, to be this mock print writer. And so what I do is I say, I use this magical method called when from the Mockito API. And I say, listen, when response to get writer is invoked, so this mock response get writers method is invoked, then return my mock print writer object. Because, and the reason I need to do this is because when I invoke do get, it will call get writer on the response. So I, this is my code under, my, under test, my servlet dot do get. So I'm just going to call it, and I just call it normally, right? This is a, a real, a plain old servlet, right? Here I have a real object; it's not a mock object. I call do get, and I give it my mock request and my mock response. But you know what? The do get method over here it doesn't care that what it's getting here is a mock uh, request and a mock response. It just knows it's getting some request and some response, and it's going to treat it accordingly. So I do it. This is my, uh, I guess this is my, my given. This is my, uh, well, actually, all of this is my given. In my unit test, this is my when. And then the, the verification, the then part, is I say the following. I'm going to say, listen, um, in this scenario, because there are no dictionary entries, I do not expect the print writer to be interacted with at all. In particular, I don't. I, I expect that the print line method on the print writer is never invoked. And the way I express this in Makito is I use the verify method. I'm going to say that the again the print writer's uh, method, uh, the print writer is never invoked with the print line method with any argument. Right, so yep, never ever invoked. But I will, I do want to verify that the response, uh, the response had its set status method invoked with the value SCOK, with the value of 200. Now, this will probably look really foreign to you. And I understand that, right? Because what we're doing here is we have like a, a, a unit test for some very complex code that has like some complex APIs associated with it you didn't write. And we're kind of making all these pretend objects around it. And then saying, okay, hey, here's like the real code, send the pretend objects that way. And then the neat thing about these pretend objects is that they keep track of how they've been inter interacted with. So there's all this magical bookkeeping that these mock objects have. So that after you've interacted with them, you can verify that they were interacted with in the manner that you expect. That's what these verify methods do. Again, you can verify that the print line method of this print writer was never invoked. And you can verify that the set status method of the HTTP, uh, the, the mock HTTP request was invoked with the value SCOK. And again, when I run this, it passes because that's exactly what happens. So when I call do get and there are no, um, there are no entries in the dictionary, nothing is written to the print writer and it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, and, and you said server, I'm going, to, I'm going to amend it and say servlet, because the server is not running in this case, right? It is just a plain old unit test. Yep. The, the mock objects don't. The test does right here. Right, that is the test calling servlet.doget, and when it provides the doget method, is the mock objects. Yeah, the mock objects, are, great question. The mock objects are all created right here. And then the mock request and the mock response are sent to a plain old servlet, a real servlet. And then, uh, now, I mean, do get doesn't return anything, right? So how do you 
validate that yes, you know, the right thing happened? Well, you interrogate the mock objects. The mock objects uh, record everything that happens to them. And so you say, great, hey, print writer, you were never invoked, you know, your print line method was never invoked, right? And hey, response, your set, sorry, hey, response, your set status method was invoked with SCOK, right? And if it, if it wasn't, the test would fail. Kind of trippy, yeah. Let's take a look at another uh, test that uses Mockito. Here I have a test that adds one word to uh, a dictionary. So I'm basically going to uh, say, hey, listen, when I, uh, I'm going to have a word in a definition, and when I post the, that word in the definition to uh, the, the servlet, I'm going to verify that uh, the that, that uh, the the message that was uh, oh, okay, I'm, going to, I'm going to verify that yes, the message that I expect was written, and that the uh, the the word was actually defined with that definition. And in this case, we're going to use a mixture of the Mockito API and the plain old Hamcrest API to, uh, to validate things. So the first thing I gotta do is I gotta set up my test. So my, here's my test data. It's gonna be a word that has the value, you know, test word and a definition that has the value test, test, test definition. And then I'm gonna create a mock uh, servlet request and configure it to behave the way that I want. So I'm going to create my uh, mock request. I'm going to say when my uh, when the get parameter on the request is invoked with the value of uh, of word, uh, then return the particular word I'm testing with. So this is basically you know if you think about the uh, like the if you think about what's going on in the UI here, oops, what we're doing is we're putting the word, what was it, test, yeah, we're putting test word in, test word in here, and we're putting uh, test definition in here, and clicking submit. That's basically what we're simulating here. And so from the servlet's point of view, it's going to have uh, a word parameter, so this is word here, that uh, is the value test word, and a definition parameter with the value test definition. And uh, it's also, uh, so I mock out my request, and so my request is going to behave like that. And now I'm also going to mock out my response so that I can capture what the response is telling me. So I'm going to create a new response object, and I'm going to configure the print writer, but instead of having a mock print writer, actually I'm going to use a real print writer object which is wrapped around a string writer. Now a string writer provides the writer interface and basically buffers up all of the, or, or saves, all of the text that's written to that writer to a string of memory. So this is a good way of capturing what is written to a writer, in this case a print writer. So I'm gonna use that Mockito API to say, hey listen, when the get writer is requested from, well when the writer, when the get writer method is evoked on response, then I'm going to return this print writer right here, which is a real print writer, but that will uh, capture um, everything that's written to it in this string. So those are my mock objects. Now I'm going to call do post, right? So what does post do? It goes and validates that the word and the definition are have been provided, and then it will uh, populate that word and definition pairing in the dictionary, and uh, then return SC OK if everything is OK. So I'm going to do that, and uh, then I'm going to do the following. I'm going to assert that. So this is a Hamcrest assertion that you know we learned about uh, you know early on in the class. I'm going to say that great, the string that has that was been built up in that string writer. So whatever was written to that print writer gets stored in the string writer. I want to make I want to assert that that string contains that defined word as. So you know defined you know go as a deer for female deer. That is the message that is written to the response um, after it's uh, after it's invoked. Actually, let's just let me just show that to you, right? So we click submit. This does the do post, and then writes the string to find test word test definition. That's exactly what I'm uh, asserting here. 
Um, now, for the sake of, uh, of, uh, of demonstration, I'm going to use a feature of Mockito called argument capture to get myself the value of set status. So I can create this argument capture of an integer, and then I say, hey, listen, verify that the set status method of response was uh, in, uh, verify that it was invoked, and would you please store the value that was, it was invoked with into this, um, this status code capture. And then I can call get value on that captured um, item. And I'm going to assert that it is equal to SCOK. And lastly, I'm going to ask the servlet, I'm going to call this get definition method. We didn't see this before, but get definition simply return for a word, simply goes and looks it up in the dictionary. It's a nice little convenient method for testing, and that's why I've marked it visible for testing. And I'm going to assert that the definition that was returned by the servlet is equal to the definition I expect. And so this test then validates everything about the do post method. It validates that it's able to get the, uh, the word and the definition from the HTTP request as it expects. It then uh, verifies that the message defined word as is uh, written to the, uh, the body of the HTTP response via its print writer. It asserts that the HTTP status code that was uh, returned, uh, that was populated by the, the do post is SCOK. And then finally, it validates that the uh, value stored in the dictionary in the servlet was the, uh, was the definition that I expected. Sure enough, when you run this, it ought to pass. And it does. So, the, it, it, what I hope you get out of this, other than it's like, oh my gosh, this is kind of some you know, crazy advanced stuff, is that it is possible to write true unit tests for complex code like an HTTP servlet that has a lot of dependencies on objects that are, are, are third party, that are written by, um, you know, that are standard objects here. And you can use Mockito to provide these mock implementations of these objects that behave in the way that you want um, and so that the code under test, which is do post and do get, um, can just, doesn't need to worry about what's passed in. And you don't need to go to lots of, um, uh, you don't need to contort the code to somehow decouple it from the HTTP servlet request. Now maybe, you know, some might argue that might, that might be a better thing to do. Not in this case, I think. Here I want to show you the power of mock objects. I hope you've learned to appreciate, or at least, you know, sort of seen that, okay, they are a thing. And they can be used to do some pretty powerful stuff. Now that you've had a, a brief and admittedly quick introduction to, to mock objects and testing them, what else can I tell you? What else would you like to know? Yeah, I have a little head exploding, that's fine. This is the most advanced stuff that you've seen so far. Nope. Okay. I want to spend a couple minutes giving a preview of, of next time, and then I think we'll call it a night. So we've been focusing on the servlet uh, tonight. So we saw the right-hand side of this picture. Right? We saw the phone bill servlet. We talked about do get method, do post method. We talked about how to unit test it. Well, next time we're going to focus in on the left-hand side here and the phone bill rest client. Now, the phone bill REST client and the Project 4 main class that drives it, um, they communicate, they, they put together URLs and make calls to the, uh, the web application over HTTP. And so then, uh, those are, well, uh, and, and, and so then, we're going to look at that code. We're also going to see how we can test that code. Um, and we do similar things, we have similar techniques 
to testing that complex code, which has a big dependency, right? So, uh, you know, the phone bill REST client depends on a, uh, a web application um, running. And again, uh, in a unit test, you can't be starting up a web application. So we'll see how we can test the, uh, the phone bill REST client outside of the, uh, without the, the web application running. Then we'll also see how to test the, uh, the phone bill REST client and Project 4 with the, with the application running. And that's, that'll be in the integration tests. So in Project 4, you start seeing what I would call true integration tests. Because the ones, the integration tests in Project 1, 2, and 3, the command line, you know, it's, uh, yeah, we, we, we have that invoke main uh, test case that we can, you know, use as a framework for calling main, and we can capture the, the standard output and the standard error. And that's good, and that allows you to write some pretty powerful tests. Um, but I wouldn't really call them true integration tests because you're not really integrating that much stuff. Project 4, though, our integration tests um, require uh, Jetty to be running. So actually, I'll just uh, maybe go find some of them now and run them just to show you, uh, you know, how it works. So there's an integration test for, uh, oh yeah, the phone bill rest client. Sure. And so then we'll go into details here. But when we run all of this, this actually then goes and makes calls to the, um, to the uh, servlet. And I think you'll see then if we then go back and look at the, uh, the test. Is it cleaned up after itself? I can't remember. Oh, maybe it does clean up after itself. Uh, does it? No, no, I said it should, it should remove all tests, no, all dictionary entries. So why is there still stuff there? Interesting. I would have expected that to blow away everything. And there's still that. Okay. I wonder why that was. Okay. So I didn't quite understand that. But anyway, the idea here is that we are able to um, we are able to use this uh, REST client object to abstract the the REST API. So we have a more fluid sorry more fluent interface a more fluent Java API more fluid Java interface for working with the uh, with the REST API. And then the main uh, program can interact with that more easily. So we'll spend the first half of class next week um, uh, learning about that. And then the second half of class will break ground on refactoring this application to look a little bit more like your phone bill application to stop using terms like dictionary and start using uh, terms like, like phone bill and phone call so that the um, uh, so, so that you know we can get an idea of how you might morph this uh, project out of the box, this out of the box, this out of the box um, dictionary project into your phone bill application. And that's uh, what we talked about on Wednesday. Awesome. Yeah. Any final thoughts or questions before we leave? Okay, excellent. Thank you all very much. I will see you on Wednesday.